This video goes with Chapter 2 of the course BUIS 2010 Introduction to Information Systems and is called Computers and Their Application. I'm Dr. Renault from Shawnee State University and I'll be taking you through this brief video presentation. What is a computer? Well, a computer is a machine. A computer is a device. It's a, yeah, it's a machine that takes data, that takes stuff that takes uh, programs or instructions on what to do with the stuff and it spits something different out. It basically translates or converts data into something meaningful. Even in the context of your smartphone because data would be the digital packets that represent sound and it processes the sound and lets you hear it and lets your voice get processed in digital packets and then sent away. So you can see that that even your phone is a computer, it's a machine that processes very specific data into very specific output. So what comes in and then uh, what we have to do to define the computer is we really need to understand what comes into the computer. What's the input? <coughs> what is the output? What is What does the user want? the computer to do, and then what is the step-by-step -step algorithm, the step-by-step -step set of instructions that we need to to transform the data into the output or or to, to, to make the machine do what we want it to do. Also remember that um, if we've got bad data coming in, we're going to probably have bad output. You know, if uh, and there's the old example, old old word, old phrase in the industry known as garbage in, garbage out. So uh, part of your programs have to learn to to filter some of that garbage and to eliminate some of the stuff you don't want to give you the stuff you do. What makes up a computer system? Well, the, the book kind of thought about it one way, but I've I've kind of listed a computer system as broken up into five major parts. The first part is the is the part you're actually touching. It's the input output part of the system. The keyboard, the mouse, the screen, the uh, printer, the camera, the microphone, you know all of those things that that get information and get data from you into the system or gives you the information back out of the system. There's software inside the computer because the soft this computer can't do anything without software and we'll talk more about software in future slides there's the the brain of the of the computer also known usually as the processor or central processing unit some computers also have a separate graphics processing unit or GPU that processes the graphical output um, most high-end and gaming machines have have separate processor and graphical processor. But the processor is really stupid. It doesn't know how to do a whole lot. Move things around, add, subtract, multiply, divide, move things around, copy things, move things around in memory. I mean, it, it really doesn't know how to do much, but it does it and does it really well, accurately and fast. Some processors are multi-core, so some computers have multiple processors in them, and then there are processors and processes within the computer to share tasks and to make tasks work across multiple processors. Most modern computers, including the computer that's sitting in front of you probably, is a multi-processor, uh, has a multi-core processor. There's memory, which is the temporary, well not always temporary, but it's the fast storage that the processor can manipulate directly. There are two general classes of memory. There's a class of memory called RAM, which stands for Random Access Memory. It's very fast, it's readable, it's writable, it's mutable, it's changeable. Now, as soon as you turn your computer off, the RAM is erased. So you can't use RAM for storage or any, any kind of long-term storage, but for short-term storage, computational storage, short-term data storage, um, that kind of stuff. Wow, RAM is great. You gotta have it. You gotta have lots of it. It's got
got to be fast. There's also a type of memory called ROM or read-only memories, ROMs. ROMs are the chips that that we save our programs to and they never ever ever erase. There's a ROM inside your computer that that when you turn your computer on it's called BIOS and it's the basic input operating system that takes over and and starts your computer to boot. Well that's written on a computer chip or a ROM chip. There are ROM chips in your car that tell it what to do there are ROM chips in your refrigerator. There are ROM chips in your phone. Um, it's where we store. It's where we store those kind of programs that don't change. Um, there's a special type of memory called a flash memory, and we're all familiar with a little USB flash stick like this one that uh, lets us store data, unplug it, remove it from power, and then modify the data. This is kind of a cross between RAM and ROM. Um, it's called flash memory. And the fifth part of a, of a serious computer system is storage. Because we need it to store the applications, the data, the databases, the, the videos, the sound, all of it. The settings and on all of those things from when we turn it off and turn it back on again or when we use it or when we don't use it. Um, storage usually is done on on uh, hard drives, kind of like this little laptop hard drive. But this this disk, this actually contains a set of spinning platters, a set of spinning disks, and little read-write heads that move back and forth across those spinning disks to uh, save data on a somewhat permanent basis. Um, now disks fail because they have little motors and moving parts, uh, those kind of, of rotating disks. There's also a type of disk known as an SSD or a solid state drive, which is more akin to flash memory, but it's used as the main storage device. You can also store data on the cloud, on magnetic tapes, on RAID arrays, which is a redundant array of independent drives. So it's basically a special box that contains, or maybe inside your computer itself, that contains multiple drives that copy each other. So one drive could fail and you don't lose any data. There's something called the SAN, a storage area network, which is where um, in an enterprise you would have a very large RAID array that everybody shares that data shares that storage. All your PCs, all your servers, and everybody shares that one master storage device. The great thing about that is it's backed up, fault tolerant, and all those other cool things. And NAS network attached storage, which also is a type of storage area network, kind of a cloud thing of putting the data outside your computer to store. So based upon those five components I mentioned, you know, we, we have to measure the speed and the storage of a, of a computer system, both the memory, the hard disks, the speed of the processor, how fast it can do something. Um, let's talk about the measurements we use for storage. And the first measurement is the bit. A bit is literally a one or a zero, just the number one or the number zero buried deep inside the computer's memory or the, on the hard disk or on any storage device. That's how the computer stores everything, as a series of ones and zeros. Think about that really complex picture of your, of your grandmother. Um, think about the vacation movies and all of that. That's literally stored as a series of ones and zeros grouped together in groups of eights. We call a group of eight bits a byte, a B-Y-T-E, a byte. Um, and a byte can contain a number between 0 and 255, or from negative 128 to positive 127. So a byte is 8 bits strung together, 1s and zeros strung together, and it can store up to 256 different values, 0 to 255. If we take 1,024 of those bytes and string them together, we have something called a kilobyte, or 2 to the 10th power bytes. We call that a kilobyte, a KB. 
it's basically a thousand, a little more than a thousand, but approximately a thousand bytes jammed together. That's a kilobyte. My first computer had four kilobytes of memory. Let's think about that when we get a little further along in this discussion. A thousand kilobytes, which would be a thousand thousand, which would be a million, we call that a megabyte. So a thousand kilobytes is a megabyte. Um, a thousand megabytes is approximately one billion bytes. We call that a gigabyte. The computer I'm using right now has 16 gigabytes of memory, which means that it's four million times larger in memory than the first computer I had. Four million times bigger. Wow! It's huge. Um, and systems are even bigger. Um, of, so even larger systems are available if you need more storage. Um, a thousand gigabytes is a terabyte. And, and you know, this little memory stick of mine this little memory stick of mine is a uh, is a one terabyte memory stick, like one thousand billion bytes, or one million million bytes of data can be stored on this. Wow, a terabyte! And uh, most of our computers today have a terabyte hard drive, or maybe even a two terabyte drive. The computer I'm working on right now has got a half a terabyte solid state uh, and uh, one terabyte internal and then a two terabyte external. So I've got three and a half terabytes of storage on this computer. Wow. A thousand terabytes, which is two to the fiftieth power, <laughs> is called a petabyte. And um, there are lots of organizations in the world that have a petabyte of storage today. Uh, that's relatively new. It's, it's been a recent thing. The first computer hard drive I bought was a 10 megabyte hard drive. Let's go up and look at that number way up at the top there. 10 megabyte. It had 10 million bytes. And now I have three terabytes, three and a half terabytes, or a thousand, thousand, three hundred thousand times the storage on my laptop. That's crazy. Um, and uh, storage is just going to continue to expand and explode. Bis some businesses, including the U.S. federal government and lots of other uh, major organizations, even could have Google could even have an exabyte, which is a thousand petabytes, which is a thousand thousand terabytes, which is a thousand 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 gigabytes. So think of a billion gigabytes of storage is what is an exabyte. You really do need to keep these general numbers in your head. You know, a K, a byte is a, is a number between 0 and 255, usually used to represent a a character in the um, a character in the U English language um, it takes up to three bytes to store interna some international characters using special encoding a pixel on your screen a little dot there on your monitor like that one right there um, it actually uses um, three or four bytes to represent that pixel inside the computer's memory, inside the video processor's memory. So that's kind of kind of neat to think about that. Um, so remember that a kilobyte is a thousand bytes, a megabyte is a million bytes, a gigabyte is a billion bytes, and a terabyte would be, well, a thousand billion I don't remember what that's called, but you get the idea. Kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte. And you really do need to commit those commit those to, to memory. The next thing, you know, that's, that's how big a computer is. 
But now let's stop and think about how fast a computer is because your computer is just just fastly fast. I mean ridiculously fast. Um, most things are measured in seconds. How many seconds does it take you to run a lap? How many seconds does it take you to drive a quarter of a mile? You know, how many seconds does it take to, uh, to eat a cheeseburger, right? That would be something you measure in seconds or possibly fractional seconds. There's a measurement that you will see throughout your professional career called the millisecond. And a millisecond is one thousandth of a second. So 500 milliseconds is equal to a half a second. Um, 100 milliseconds is one tenth of a second. Makes sense. A microsecond is one one millionth of a second. So a microsecond is one one millionth of a second. Now your computer that's processing along at 3 gigahertz or faster can do things in nanoseconds, which is one billionth of a second. A nanosecond is one billionth of a second. And then a picosecond is one thousandth billionth of a second. So you can see how many zeros are in a picosecond. So you do need to commit byte, bit, kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte, second, microsecond, milli oops, millisecond, microsecond, nanosecond, and picosecond, and kind of know what the ratios of the me are. You know, know what that fraction of a second or know what that multiplying factor means. I kind of stole my thunder on this slide, on a previous slide, but computers come in lots of sizes from the little tiny embedded systems that are embedded within uh, maybe a device or embedded within a consumer product to the sub notebook systems you know the 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 Chromebooks and the the notebooks then there are the personal computers and the desktops and the gaming computers and then we start getting into the mini computers which are computers servers that are shared by multiple users up to the mainframe which is a gargantuan computer and then lastly there's something we call the supercomputer some supercomputers have thousands and thousands of computer processors and are used by well uh, used by the department of energy used by the military used by researchers used by geneticists used by medical researchers and others to, to calculate and to do really big things, the supercomputer. Um, I have a, a, a colleague, a uh, fellow I went to, to uh, a graduate school with, who's at uh, Oak Ridge, the National Laboratory down in Tennessee, and he designs computer software that uses a supercomputer to analyze the shape of an airplane's wing to reduce drag and increase lift and by doing that by tweaking an aircraft's wing very tiny and then running mathematical simulations they're creating airplanes that fly on less fuel and fly further and safer. Kind of a neat idea to think about some of the crazy things that your PC certainly can't do. It's going to take thousands of processors to be able to do that in any kind of timely basis. And that would be a supercomputer. And, you know, I don't know. There I go, pointing in the wrong direction. I don't know what the future of computers is. And that's why I put the question marks there at the bottom of, of the many sizes. I don't know where they're going. You know, the first computer I had, my first computer had a small, slow, 8-bit processor. The processors in today's computers are 8 times as wide, 64 bits. So they process 64 bits at once instead of 8 bits at once. They process at speeds that are tens of thousands of times faster, and they have multiple, sometimes as many as a dozen, cores or sub-processors running all at once. 
So think about what you have on your desktop versus what I started with many years ago. Where the future is going to go, I don't know. Quantum computing, uh, massively large computing, I have no idea where the future is going to go, but I bet you'll see things that are just ridiculously huge um, in the future. And you'll probably also see the whole idea of embedded nanosystems becoming so much more powerful and, and so much uh, more ubiquitous, more everywhere. Talked about a computer being made up of five main components. Well, one of the components I said was software, the programming to make that hardware, to make that device actually do something. The instructions. Well, there are two kind of broad classes of software. There's the operating system, which um, kind of sits between the hardware and the user. It's it's the it's the thing that allows lots of different types of hardware to run the same program. You know whether you've got a Intel processor, an AMD processor, or whether you've got this much memory or that much memory, or whether you've got this type of disk or that type of disk. It doesn't matter because the operating system handles all of those differences for you. So it kind of sits between the user and the hardware. Um, or the application software and the hardware. Windows, Linux, Mac OS, uh, IBM ZOS, which is an operating system that runs on their mainframe computers, um, AIX, um, HPUX, which are two Unix type systems that run on servers. So there are lots of different kinds of operating systems depending upon what you need. Well, your Android operating system or your iOS operating system on your smartphone operating systems. What an operating system does is it allocates the resources. It, it handles sending jobs to the processor. It handles moving things around in memory. It handles making sure things get saved when you tell it to save and where to save it. It handles the sharing. It handles the networking, the communication. It handles a lot of, of, of all that nitty-gritty stuff um, that allows us to use the computer. And then a user, you and me and, and everybody else, uses application software or programs that run on top of our operating systems, that run on top of the hardware, to actually let us do things. Our word processor, our spreadsheet our presentation software, our video viewing software, or video creation software, our browser, our chat client. Hey, there's even games like Doom and Minecraft and all kinds of modern fabulous games. And, and you know, even a gaming system like your Xbox or your PlayStation 98 or whatever, PlayStation 5 or 6 or 7, I don't know what number they're at right now, or, or really matter, they have an operating system that loads up and starts the whole process. You then load your application, your game software, and everything just takes off. So software comes in two broad classes. Now there are lots of classes and subclasses within each of those classes, but just I wanted to get those two broad classes of software out. Software is usually written in a programming language. And you know, back in the early days of computing, back in the 1940s, 50s, and even into the 1960s, programmers literally had to program their machines in ones and zeros. Literally, a string of bits and bits to tell the computer to do certain things at certain times. It was tedious, it was difficult, it was time consuming, and it was absolutely miserable. I've never done any of that. Um, the second generation of computing pro computer languages were assembly languages. And assembly languages, we had mnemonics. We had words that represented actions, like go load the register from this memory address, or save the stack pointer to this, or copy this to here, or add this number to this number and save it over here. So there were mnemonics that we used to write programs, and we had a program that then converted that assembly language into machine language, and the program would, the computer would run that. Um, programmers still use assembly language for 
writing low-level drivers and writing um, things that have to be optimized absolutely for for absolute speed. High-level languages like C and C Sharp and Basic and Cobol and HTML and lots of other computer programming language we call them kind of third-generation languages, and they're the languages that a lot of people use for various most things. Um, Fourth-generation languages are are what we call the the scripting languages. They're more high-level because with a fourth, third-generation language, you compile it for the system, and then it, it works on that system, but it won't work directly on another. Where fourth-generation languages like scripting languages, Python, Perl, PHP, um, data access languages like SQL, kind of are, transcend the specific computer to do a specific action. And then fifth-generation languages, 5G languages, are where a lot of, of research is being done right now in modern language creation and learning um, and 5G, the fifth generation of computer languages are going to be AI languages, natural language processing or NLP languages, knowledge-based systems, visual programming, literally bringing the uh, ability to program down to people that don't have to learn a second, third, or fourth generation language to be able to do it. People being able to actually just tell the computer what they want and the computer be able to do it. Um, is that coming? Yeah, it's coming, and it's coming quick. You'll you'll certainly see it in in your career as you as you progress, regardless of whether you're a business person or a information systems person or or whatever career. You, you'll see these new fifth generation computer languages and computer programming systems continue to evolve. And that concludes video for chapter two. Thanks for watching. You can contact me at jrenault at shawnee.edu. And remember, this presentation was copyright 2021 by me, James Renault, Ph.D., at Shawnee State University. All rights are reserved. Thank you very much for watching. See you in another presentation soon.